I have enough awareness to realize the last thing you guys want to hear is another hack on YouTube talking about the guitar tone of the Beano record. But if you'll indulge me for a second, I'm not going to park here for long. I think most guitarists are going to concede that Clapton's tone on John Mayall's Blues Breakers album is probably one of the most iconic guitar sounds ever recorded. And if you don't think so, you're either too young or you're too ignorant to have listened to the record. The whole played out trope of plugging a Les Paul into a Crank Marshall started with this record. Clapton was the first guy to do it. When session engineers complained that he was too loud, he refused to turn down and thus the tone of legend was born. A sound so undeniable that every guitar hero was forced to follow in Clapton's footsteps in the pursuit of tone. So I want to talk to you about what I consider to be Clapton's best tone. And it's not the Blues Breaker album. <laughs> Today we're talking about Clapton's tone and playing on From the Cradle. This is a record that was released on September 13th, 1994. Cradle was the culmination of 10 weeks of recording with a live band at Olympic Studios in London. From the Cradle crossed my path when I was just starting out on guitar. I remember hearing it around my parents' house. I remember hearing it on vacation with my extended family. As a kid who grew up in the 80s, this was some of the first modern blues I had heard that didn't have that 80s production aesthetic. It was like, oh, this is what real electric blues is supposed to sound like. I like this. Clapton called this record a course correction, citing From the Cradle as the record he intended to make after recording Blues Breakers with John Mayall in 1966. Here's what Clapton had to say. I'm really tracing my steps back to John Mayall and the Blues Breakers. There was a stage there when I was with that band, having come from a pop band, which started as a blues band, the Yardbirds, to go to John Mayall. And then when I was leaving John Mayall, in my head I was going to an even more hardcore blues situation, which kind of backfired. Although it came out to be a great hybrid, it wasn't my intention to go that way. Now what I'm doing is I'm going back to that jumping off point. It's almost like I'm just leaving John Mayall now, and I'm producing my own blues band. And it's taken me 30 years of meandering around the back streets to get there. This record not only showcases some of Clapton's best playing, it showcases what I feel to be the pinnacle of Clapton's tone. Specifically when Clapton plugs in an ES-335 into this heavily modified 57 Tweed Twin. Clapton found this 5E8A tweed circuit sometime in the mid-80s at Pete's Guitar in Minneapolis. According to a TongueQuest report article from August of 2000, the amp was modded by Cesar Diaz in 86 who said, he replaced the power transformer with an export transformer so that it could be used in both the US and the UK. Diaz also replaced the dual rectifier tubes with a solid state silicon rectifier and installed two more 6L6 power tubes in the place of the removed rectifier tubes. Lee Dixon, Clapton's guitar tech at the time, stated they typically ran the amp with two of the output tubes pulled to cut the volume. The amp first made its live debut in February of 91 during the Blues Night of Clapton's legendary 24 Nights run at Royal Albert Hall. It became Clapton's favorite amp over the next decade. The amp was used for the majority of the Cradle sessions and taken out on the road for the subsequent Nothing But The Blues tour to promote the album. Clapton loved this amp so much that he commissioned Fender to replicate it. And after a botched attempt by Fender, the task fell to John Sewer, who was a master builder in the Fender Custom Shop at the time. Here's what John said about building these tweed replicas for Clapton. One of Eric Clapton's favorite amps was a modified low-power tweed twin. It was modified by Cesar Diaz. Cesar Diaz had passed away. All they wanted was that amp reproduced. Somebody over there, who I'm not going to mention, did his best with what he thought was, was, was what Clapton oh. wanted. Clapton was so disappointed, he said he was going to leave Fender. Clapton was using a low power tweed twin where Cesar Diaz uh, put a bigger power transformer in, left the original output transformer. Caesar took out the two tube rectifiers and replaced them with tubes. So he had four tubes now, but he still had the original output transformer. It doesn't make it an 80 or 100 watt amp. It, the output transformer still couldn't produce 
any more than it was doing, maybe 50 watts. And so John Page called me in the office and said, John, you know amps. We're in a problem with, with Clapton. He wants to leave and go to Gibson and because he's he feels insulted and so i got a chance to talk to to lee his tech i said so what's what's the problem and he brought both amps and he says well look he goes one's a tweed one's brown one's got a chrome chassis the other one's got a brown panel one's got chicken beak black knobs the other one's got brown knobs this amp sounds like this this amp is like way louder it didn't sound anything like it. everything was wrong as far as clapton was concerned i said yeah i'll take a crack at it i want the original amp and i want the one that bruce did so i can see you know what went wrong and it really wasn't anything like clapton's original amp right there it was pretty easy for me to go this is why he doesn't like it so i, I built eric the amp there was a there was a macintosh rewind service a guy named uh, dennis hoyer who is the only authorized macintosh rewind service in the country and he just happened to have a friend who worked at triad and he used to work at triad or something like that but he was able to get the original prints for that transformer so I had the transformers custom made. I uh, drew the chassis up. I had it bent. I had them chrome plated. Every single part of that amp was hand built custom. I used PEC military pots because I can't get the old pots, but everything I could do, cloth wire, everything, I tried to make it a, a reproduction that was going to be reliable. It was a little disappointing on the first day because I think I, I didn't really pay too much attention to the cabinetry. I thought the amp sounded great, but when we A-beat it to Eric's original amp, his original amp sounded just looser and spongier, and there was something old sounding about it that mine didn't have. Finally, we figured out the problem was wasn't the amp at all. It was the cabinet. Tim Myers, who was uh, the keyboard tech for Clapton's band, actually recone these old Oxford speakers for Eric for the amps. I even had him recone speakers for me for the amp. So it wasn't the speakers. I didn't believe it was the amp. It turned out to be the cabinet. The old baffle board was so loose. I mean, you could push on the amp and it would go side to side. It was only held together by the tweet. So then what we did is we went out and we had this guy, Bill Giles, who's a cabinet guy. He sourced out some old pine. Eric was very happy and he played the amps for years until it got to a point where th those amps used 12 A, um, AY7s in them in the preamp section. Lee started to complain that they were starting to sound dirty. I got one of the amps back later and I figured out the problem. He had replaced all the 12AY7s with 12AX7s, which have yeah. a much higher gain. You can't put 12AX7s in that amp. It's just, not, it's just wrong. But I think he used those amps on uh, for a while. One of those cream reunions, I think he used them on. It turns out that John made three replicas for Eric, one for B.B. King, who I think gave it to a roadie or a guitar player, and then he made one for Mark Knopfler. Clapton went on to use the replicas for the next four years, and he eventually sold two of the replicas at a Bonhams auction in 2011. Clapton's playing during this era just has this renewed purity to it. It's as if he had found this way to harness the ferocity of his blues breaker days and channel in all these life experiences that he had had, and it's all gone into his playing. And at the time of From the Cradle, Clapton had overcome substance abuse. He remained sober through the tragic death of his son. There's just like an earnestness to his music at the time. You hear a man who's lived through some hard times to come out the other side. He's no longer just a man playing the blues, but he's a man who's lived them. You can hear that he's returned to the music that ignited his passion for the guitar. Gone is the Bradshaw rig and the Soldano. And all that remains is the man, his guitar, and his amp. And that's the sign of a real player. If you can do it just that, you can do it anywhere. You know, it reminds me of the scene from the Last Dance documentary about Michael Jordan and the 90s Bulls. I see if all that trash talking starts when it's zero zero instead of five six point lead. That's where it starts. That's the sign of a good man. If you can talk shit when it's even score, or talk shit when you're behind score, when you're ahead, it's easy to talk. It's not a perfect parallel, but it's how I imagine Clapton's got to feel. That's the sign of a good man. If he can play without his wet dry setup or without his fancy pedal board, it's easy to play well with all that stuff. But if you can still play and move people without all that, that's the sign of a good player. So that's what I think we should take away from this era of Clapton. Maybe we should challenge ourselves. Try turning off that always on pedal that you just have to have. Can you still sound as interesting? Don't plug your guitar into the pedal board, plug it straight into the amp. Can you still figure out ways to play inspired music? 
If you're playing a modeler, just dial up a simple patch with an amp block and a tuner. Try playing that song you've been learning all the way through without stopping. These are great ways to force ourselves to grow as musicians and keep the main thing the main thing. You know, we're all subject to an endless feed of posts and rig rundowns showcasing the latest and greatest gear, and there's nothing wrong with checking out gear. Obviously, you can tell I like to do it. It's great. Just don't let that become your identity as a player. I'm preaching to myself just as much as I'm talking to you guys. So the next time you're talking with your musician buddies, resist the temptation to default to gear talk. You know, I want to challenge you to talk about the songs that you're learning or writing or playing. Share a voice memo of a song idea instead of a link to a pedal. I think we all could do better to foster more musical dialogue in the community, myself included. Well, if you made it this far in the video, I want to say I'm surprised and I also want to say thank you. Appreciate you taking the time to watch. And if you're not subscribed to the channel, please consider subscribing. 93% of my viewers are not subscribed. And when you guys subscribe, it helps me get these videos in front of more eyes and grow the channel. Also, when you guys thumbs up and comment, that engagement helps get these videos recommended to other viewers. If you found any value in what you heard here today, you can thank me just by doing one of those things. And if you want to learn how to solo like one of Clapton's biggest influences, you can check out this video here. Thanks again, guys. I really appreciate you watching. I'll catch you guys in the next video.